Okay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much um, for having me. Uh, my name is Mimi, and then I'm going to be talking about pseudarthrosis. Um, so we'll do kind of just a brief overview, um, starting with a background. I'll spend most of my time on lumbar um, degenerative pseudarthrosis, and then we'll touch a little bit on um, cervical pseudarthrosis before we wrap up. Um, so the first lumbar fusions were performed in patients with POTS disease and spinal deformity from tuberculosis. Um, Dr. Bosworth, he was a spine surgeon um, in Staten Island in the 1940s, and his dictum was that the only way to be sure of the status of a fusion was to explore it surgically. So he routinely explored all of his fusions at the end of one year, and routine exploration of fusions continued well into the 1980s, especially in school U.S. patients. However, kind of as CT started to become um, more routinely used, there was a renewed interest in identifying identifying pseudarthrosis radiographically, and the rates of lumbar fusion have only continued to increase. Um, the indications have expanded. They include degenerative conditions, deformity, traumatic congenital and neoplastic conditions. Um, so now it's 2021, and I hope that this talk, um, at least for me, it gave me context as to what to do with, you know, the post-operative lumbar fusion patient that presents to clinic who has maybe questionable x-rays and pain, um, or the pseudarthrosis patient that clearly has a pseudarthrosis but is asymptomatic. The definition of pseudarthrosis is a failure of fusion diagnosed over a year or about a year after the index surgery. And the FDA guidelines for successful lumbar fusion are less than three millimeters of translational motion or less than five degrees of angular motion on dynamic radiographs. There's a classification system um, for lumbar pseudarthrosis. There's atrophic, complex, shingled, and transverse. Um, I have not seen this used in clinic or really um, utilized in the literature other than as a reference, like it doesn't really guide um, treatment or prognosis a whole lot. Um, but in reading through this, I, I still thought it was valuable to go over. Um, I think about it similar to how I think about atrophic non-unions. So an atro or a non orthopedic non-unions essentially. So atrophic pseudarthrosis similar to atrophic non-unions. There's gross atrophy, um, resorption of the bone graft. There's something probably wrong with the biology. Um, shingled and transverse are similar to hypertrophic non-unions in that there's um, a substantial mass of bone. Um, however, there's no fusion, so this could be related to more of a biomechanical cause. And then complex doesn't really fit into the oligotrophic um, non-union category, but it kind of references more the pattern of the non-union and the bone that's there. But again, um, not super commonly used from, from my review of the literature. So the problem with pseudarthrosis is that it can be very challenging to diagnose. It's not always symptomatic, and it's unclear why some cases of pseudarthrosis are asymptomatic with excellent long-term clinical outcomes, while others require significant management and treatment. And then the, the final problem is that fixing pseudarthrosis, you know, it, it doesn't always correlate with improved outcomes. So in this Carpenter study, even though 94% of their patients um, achieved fusion in the revision setting, only a quarter of them were satisfied. The um, ANSCNS guidelines have grade B recommendations that successful radiographic fusion actually leads to improved clinical outcomes. And this is based off of level two and level three studies. So delving more into lumbar pseudarthrosis specifically, there's multiple risk factors. Age um, is one of them. So overall pseudarthrosis is probably higher in older patients who have osteoporosis and poor bone quality, but symptomatic pseudarthrosis tends to be higher in younger patients. Um, this kind of ties in with, um, you know, other metabolic bone issues, osteoporosis, vitamin D deficiency, um, other metabolic um, and endocrinopathies. Tobacco use has also been implicated. It's unclear whether the mechanism is nicotine or TCDD, which is a halogenated aromatic hydrocarbon. Um, that's been shown to reduce osteoblast formation and bone metabolism in vitro. And then there are um, surgical factors, so excessive motion at our transitions or um, instrument failure. Um, this was a retrospective review of 2,700 elective spine patients. 6% of them were um, symptomatic in terms of their pseudarthrosis. When those patients were referred to endocrinology, 82% um, of them actually had a pre-existing endocrinopathy with vitamin D deficiency and osteoporosis being the most common causes. Um, and then 98% of the ones that were referred to endocrine had a, either a treatment modification or a new diagnosis. Vitamin D um, is also, you know, something that we can intervene on. 
Um, this is a study of 133 patients who underwent cervical thoracic or lumbar fusions. 23% of these patients had vitamin D deficiency. Um, and while not uh, significant on univariate uh, regression, multivariate regression did identify vitamin D deficiency as an independent predictor of non-union. Um, so I think this kind of goes along with the Own the Bone initiative by AAOS that, you know, a lot of times patients with um, spinal pathology will present to the spine surgeons first. And it's fairly inexpensive um, and easy to just start vitamin D supplementation and have them continue their care with their um, primary care, or their internal medicine doctor. This was a multi-centered randomized study out of Japan. They looked at the effect of weekly teriparatide administration on lumbar fusion. The patients were females who had um, osteoporosis um, as well as lumbar degenerative disease. And they either went um, TLIF or PLIF um, plus or minus weekly teriparatide for six months. And at six months, they found that bony fusion was significantly higher in the teriparatide arm compared with the control arm. Um, however, there was no real difference in patient reported outcomes between the two groups in terms of ODI and JOA, and they all showed improvement compared to baseline. So I think, you know, while this was an interesting study, I would have been more interested to see their follow up at one to two years. There are, um, you know, a lot of concerns about anti-inflammatory use and pseudarthrosis. So animal studies from the 1970s have raised concern about fracture healing and the inhibiting effect of anti-inflammatories. This is thought to work through um, pro inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis and reducing the inflammatory response. And depending on what meta-analysis you look at, um, I, I think that there's our understanding of anti-inflammatories and bone healing is incomplete at best. So Lee et al., um, these authors performed a meta-analysis of five retrospective reviews on anti-inflammatories and spinal fusion. They found that high dose um, tortol had an adverse effect on spinal fusion. However, normal dose anti-inflammatories when used for a short course did not appear to produce inferior results. Um, so they postulated that um, anti-inflammatories on spinal fusion might be dose dependent. However, further study would be needed. Um, Dr. Wheatley, uh, he actually did a meta-analysis of 26 studies on bone healing and anti-inflammatory use. This is a more recent meta-analysis, and this was kind of all comers, um, so not just spine, but fracture healing, um, long bone fractures, et cetera. His sub-analysis of the spine included 1,100 patients, and those who had been exposed to anti-inflammatory did demonstrate delayed union, non-union, or pseudarthrosis. So kind of taking all of this information together, I do think that, um, you know, we should probably avoid high dose um, anti-inflammatories in the fusion um, population. However, if a short course is needed, um, I don't necessarily think um, it's harmful, or at least the literature wouldn't um, say that. Just to kind of touch base on adult deformity, and I know this is a, a talk in and of itself, um, but I think there are some relevant um, risk factors. Um, this uh, study out of WashU did a retrospective chart review of 96 patients who underwent spinal fusion for adult scoliosis. They had an overall pseudarthrosis rate of 17%. Um, when they did their multivariate analysis, risk factors included fusion at the thoracolumbar junction, older patient age, greater number of levels fused in those with thoracolumbar kyphosis greater than uh, 20 degrees. The ISSG also found that um, a more caudal level of three-column osteotomy. Um, and then Dr. Isak also found that while circumferential MIS um, has lower infection rates, it may have a higher rate of pseudarthrosis. Um, so diagnosing pseudarthrosis um, is kind of a... a it can be a very challenging thing. And unfortunately, it, it seems as though um, radiographs are not the greatest predictors. They're certainly the uh, most wild, widely used. So can radiographs really determine accurate fusion? I, I think the answer is in two thirds of the time. Um, this was a study of 49 patients who underwent single or two level lumbar inner body fusion. Um, they underwent scheduled hardware removal and exploration of fusion at nine months. Um, and when they went and explored the um, surgery or the, the pseudar or the pseudarthrosis site, they found that the correlation between x-rays and surgical findings was roughly 69%. Um, and to kind of touch base about the flexion extension views, um, I think there's some debate in the literature as to the exact cutoffs. Um, this was a finite element analysis that simulated motion at L3, L4 with several variations of incomplete fusion. Um, depending on the surgical technique, whether it was A-lift, inner spinous fusion, or posterior lateral fusion, and the completeness of the fusion, motion could range anywhere from 0 0.8 degrees to 7 degrees. Um, and posterior fusions actually allowed for more motion. So even though the FDA has a 4-degree cutoff, it really can potentially be higher. 
Um, and then looking at kind of x-rays, flex dynamic x-rays and CT scans all together, this study um, did look at all three of those in 175 patients who underwent lumbar fusion and then reoperation. They found that x-rays had the highest accuracy per case, but CT was most specific with the 78% correlation per side. Flexion extension views were the lowest with just a 62% uh, correlation. So I think that the literature really kind of identifies CT scans as high, having the highest um, correlation between fusion um, and intraoperative finding. And then thin slice CT um, have, has really kind of improved these um, percentages even more. Some studies have quoted um, 98% um, or 95% um, correlation or better because you can see bridging trabeculation in your inner body cages and you can't really see that on x-rays. So the only downfall is the lack of motion analysis and you know, radiation exposure limits the frequency which you can obtain it. So you're not gonna be getting a CT scan at every single post-operative follow-up. Um, however, some of the other CT modalities are, you know, not necessarily um, commonly used or very good. Uh, this first study published in the Journal of Spinal Disorders, um, they found overall that spec CT correctly identified pseudoarthrosis in seven of 14 patients. So it was more or less better than the flip of a coin. And then the second study looked at um, CT color mapping for the evaluation of bony on growth, where um, their protocol showed that red equals bone on growth. They didn't have a gold standard of surgery to actually identify this as, um, you know, accurate or not accurate. All they said was the intra -oper or the intra observer and inner observer reliability was good. So I think all this paper kind of told me was that people agreed on what the color red looked like. So the guidelines per the ANS and CNS for assessing fusion status um, kind of boiled down to um, one grade A recommendation. So static lumbar x-rays are not recommended as a standalone method because they're only accurate about two thirds of the time. Um, however, CT scans with fine cut axials and multiplanar reconstruction um, is probably the best modality. However, um, they really do recommend using multiple multiple modalities. So x-rays, um, dynamic x-rays, um, CT scans as well. And there's no radiographic gold standard. So kind of putting everything together, this is um, an algorithm for, you know, following a lumbar pseudoarthrosis patient um, if you're going to evaluate them for, uh, and if you're concerned about pseudoarthrosis. So um, for a spinal fusion patient, if you know, they're doing fine, x-rays look good, and they have no symptoms, you can just do routine follow-up for two years. However, if you're concerned at all for a pseudoarthrosis, you know, probably around the one-year time point, you want to get a CT scan. Additionally, you know, other things to think about in this patient population is infection, implant failure, and adjacent segment pathology. So if all of this points to pseudoarthrosis, um, you want to you know, talk to the patient about treating their pseudoarthrosis. However, if, you know, you think it's not pseudoarthrosis, you may consider getting an MRI to look for other pathologies. Um, and then this is another algorithm. The um, other thing to kind of think about when treating pseudoarthrosis is um, that the literature says up to 50% of these patients can have um, C acnes um, if you send intraoperative cultures. Um, this algorithm says that whether you think they have an infection or not, you should obtain multiple intraoperative cultures. Um, and so there may be a role for cultures during surgery. After reviewing the literature, I don't necessarily think you have to, um, but you know, there is compelling evidence. So um, the most common um, organism is C. acnes, which is previously known as P. acnes. It's slow growing, it's low virulence. Um, and if you're going to send intraoperative cultures, um, you should send aerobic and anaerobic cultures and have them held for at least two weeks. Um, the just kind of thinking about culturing everyone, there is potentially unnecessary treatment, uh, you know, having a pick line um, for six weeks can cause psychological, physical, and economic um, implications. So this was a prospective study looking at um, 64 patients with prior instrumented fusion. They compared 32 patients with pseudoarthrosis to 32 patients um, who were controlled. So they were going surgery for PJK, implant removal, or curve progression. Um, they found that in 50% of patients, more than one out of five um, cultures were positive. There's no difference between the group. Um, if they had more than two out of five positive, um, they did undergo fish hybridization analysis, and this showed uh, bacterial aggregates without any inflammatory cells. Um, of only two of the patients had three out of five cultures positive for uh, C. acnes, and they were treated with six weeks of antibiotics, um, but ne neither had clinical signs of infection. Um, thought was to 
to treat them due to the high risk of biofilm. So they concluded that while positive cultures does not necessarily indicate an infection um, of other clinical exams, and even if the implant shows colonization, this does not necessarily translate to a clinically relevant tissue infection. Um, this paper was published out of HSS, um, a retrospective review of 578 presumed aseptic revision spine surgeries. In about 20% of cases, um, at the surgeon's discretion, intraoperative cultures were obtained. This is based off of a suspicious history despite a negative preoperative workup, questionable fluid collections, or soft tissue changes noted intraop. Um, they found that male sex and CR arthrosis were associated with having um, a higher chance of having positive cultures. So um, again, it's not unreasonable to obtain cultures in, um, in every single CR arthrosis patients because, you know, it it, it has been shown that pseudoarthrosis can be um, associated with a higher risk. So in terms of um, surgical treatment strategies, I think the bottom line is to do something different. Um, circumfer circumferential fusion is usually preferred, um, and, but however, it's important to keep in mind that outcomes are unpredictable. Um, so even if you achieve arthrodesis after revision surgery, it doesn't always equal better outcomes. Um, in terms of revising a failed posterior lateral fusion, this leaves the surgeon with the largest number of revision options. So you can either reattempt a revision posterior lateral fusion, but the rates are fairly underwhelming. Um, you can upsize the screws, use iliac crest bone, graft BMP2, use a system with a different thread pitch. You can add an um, inner body device with a larger surface area, and this has been shown to improve fusion rates, but this does require a 540 um, degree approach. For revising a failed inner body fusion, again, I think the concept is to just do something different. So if it was a T-lift, you can switch to an A-lift. Um, if it was an A-lift, you can go to the contralateral side to remove the cage and then place a different type of um, inner body fusion. However, the most, um, I think, important thing to keep in mind is that the outcomes, again, are not the most reliable. Um, and it, that's really important in terms of counseling patients and managing expectations. Um, this study looked at 66 patients who underwent revision surgery for pseudoarthrosis. Um, they will specifically add the patients who all had successful fusion. And only half of them um, in the degenerative disc disease group felt improved, and 40% of them actually felt worse. So, um, you know, this could be a combination of things. Um, you know, revision surgery hurts but also um, pain is a very complex thing and it might not necessarily be due to the uh, pseudoarthrosis itself. Um, so I'll touch base on cervical pseudoarthrosis. The um, risk factors um, are very similar to lumbar pseudoarthrosis. Um, the younger age is significantly associated with a higher rate of symptomatic pseudoarthrosis. This could be related to higher physical demand on the implant. Um, and fusion site or higher expectations in younger patients. Um, also multi-level um, fusions can be associated with a higher risk of pseudoarthrosis. Um, something I didn't know um, before I uh, prepared this talk was that um, PPI use can potentially increase the risk of pseudoarthrosis. This is a retrospective review of patients who underwent ACDF. Um, overall pseudoarthrosis rate was 8.7%. And when they did a logistic regression analysis, they found that PPI use was um, increased the odds of a clinically relevant uh, or sorry, a clinically diagnosed pseudoarthrosis. However, this did not correlate um, with a higher revision rate or patient reported outcomes at a year. So, you know, I, I don't know if this is something that um, you should necessarily chase down in your patients, but if patients have like multiple risk factors, like they're smokers um, and they're, they have like a multi-level fusion, you know, this, and you know that they have GERD and they're on a proton pump inhibitor, it might not be a bad thing to just work with, you know, their internal medicine or primary care doctor to kind of come off of it for a period of time. In terms of um, measuring it on dynamic um, radiographs, the spinous process method is the most sensitive and specific. Um, you just measure the distance between the, the two spinous processes, and if it's greater than two millimeters, it has a specificity of 89% and a sensitivity of 91%. And this is better than the Cobb angle method. However, just like um, in the lumbar uh, cohort, the lumbar patient population, CT scans um, have the greatest concordance for pseudoarthrosis um, with intraoperative findings. Um, these, this first study, they found that um, the concordance for plain x-rays was 81%, CT scans was 83%, and MRI was 66%. However, when using all three modalities, the agreement increased to uh, 95%. The, um, the other unique um, aspect of cervical spine um, fusion is that 
um, you know, different from lumbar spine fusions, pseudoarthrosis may not necessarily be symptomatic. And these are the two most kind of classically quoted studies. De Palma and Cook looked at 146 patients who underwent ACDF at one year follow-up. They found that 93.5% of their patients with pseudoarthrosis actually achieved satisfactory results. So they concluded that solid arthrodesis is not necessary for clinical success. The second paper by White et al., they looked at 65 patients who underwent ACDF for cervical spondylosis. The success rate for non-union and pseudoarthrosis, or and for, for those who had a pseudoarthrosis and those who had a successful arthrodesis um, was not statistically different. And these authors concluded that although um, fusion is desirable, it's not necessary for clinical success. Um, and how long can you wait? So I think that, you know, in the lumbar, um, the lumbar kind of literature, one year is kind of the cutoff for when you start to think about it, but in the cervical um, spine uh, literature, it, it may actually be longer. Um, Lee et al., they looked at all of their patients who after a year out from ACDF had pseudoarthrosis and they found about 32% of their patients did. However, when they waited and did nothing for two years, um, three quarters of their patients actually went on to um, achieve bony fusion. So it may be reasonable to observe for fusion up to two years. And these are the um, ANS, CNS um, consensus guidelines. Um, all of these are based off of grade D recommendations um, with level three and level four in uh, evidence. So if you think that a patient um, might have pseudoarthrosis and their clinical outcome is poor, um, you should probably evaluate for it. Um, the revision of symptomatic pseudoarthrosis should be considered because potentially if you fuse them, it may be associated with an improved clinical outcome, but Again, we can kind of tell from the literature, this is not always the case. Um, and if you're going to fuse um, or you're going to do a revision fusion on an ACDF patient, a posterior approach may be associated with a higher fusion rate. Um, so in summary, you want to identify and modify risk factors. I think, you know, the best time to get a good outcome from a fusion is probably the first time you're doing surgery um, on a patient. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that pseudoarthrosis is not always symptomatic, especially in the cervical spine. Um, and if you're gonna be trying to diagnose this, you should probably use multiple imaging modalities and consider the patient as a whole. However, the gold standard for diagnosis is still surgical exploration, but we know that that um, you know, is not something that you uh, can do just lightly. Um, you, you really have to have like a good conversation with the patient um, and about, um, and manage their, their expectations for what their outcome could be. And the final thing is, if you're going to treat these patients surgically, you want to at least think about infection um, and whether or not you obtain an intraoperative culture, I think, is um, surgeon preference. Um, and then the key thing is really to make a change in your surgical approach and technique. Um, so I wanted to thank Dr. Bruffy and Dr. Bawa for um, their feedback and help with this talk. Um, and thank you guys so much for having me and um, if there are any questions. Good job, Nini. Thank you, sir. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. Hey, Mimi, if you want just a second, like, you know, one of the, one of the important things I think that we should all take home is that a, you, you said one of them, I think, which is critical. Dr. McBarney always says that the, the, the most important time to ever get a fusion is with the first surgery. It seems like every time thereafter, it just gets harder and harder. You know, one of the reasons that statement may ring more true than ever is, you know, understanding patients before surgery, so preoperatively, um, and managing risk factors before you even operate on them. You know, and you mentioned tear parotide, uh, you mentioned bone health. Um, I, I think those things are critical as well as lifestyle issues such as smoking, obesity, um, and you know, you can really cut down on pseudoarthrosis if you are pretty diligent preoperatively on who you're operating on. You know, we don't always have that luxury, myelopathy and fractures and other things like that. But um, uh, in general, um, you know, one of the big take home messages should be that, you know, we can optimize patients and to really reduce their risk factors. And uh, uh, sorry, what are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh Yes, sir. I, I, um, I totally agree. Again, I think that um, at least from the orthopedic standpoint, um, you know, AOS is really kind of pushing um, us to, 
you know, be cognizant of um, patient, you know, factors such as vitamin D um, deficiency, um, osteoporosis, malnutrition. Um, I think it's, it's been part of our routine workup, both in the elective setting and in the trauma setting. Um, I think that, you know, the only thing that I think could potentially be improved whenever we get patients um, who get cleared for surgery, I noticed that, you know, the internal medicine doctors and the primary care physicians are always, you know, very thorough with their cardiac workup, but a lot of times they don't even really touch on like bone health. Like, you know, I, there's so many patients that go and see a primary care doctor that don't have like a recent DEXA. Um, and, and, you know, I would just think that that should be part of the um, medical optimization. Agree. And uh, which is why you know, I think the double OS you know, put it out there. We need to own the bone because we at least get that interaction with these patients. You know, and primary care doctors are just kind of getting caught up with it now, you know, and it really is very hit and miss. Yes, sir. I think the other thing too, um, that I, I didn't really mention in this talk, but I thought it was interesting um, was at Dr. Akbarnia's um, professionalism dinner last week. You know, we, we talked about um, you know, sometimes like you're getting these patients in clinic and you didn't do their initial surgery. And so like that can be very, a very challenging um, patient interaction to manage. And, um, you know, from a professional standpoint, um, Dr. Akbarnia just talked about how like, you know, even if we, and I think Fernando mentioned this too, even if we have concerns about the initial construct, you know, we weren't necessarily in the case. We don't know what happened. Um, and it's important, you know, with your patients, not only to, you know, modify their risk factors and get, you know, their history and stuff, but to just kind of um, instill in them that like, hey, I can't change what happened in the past, but, um, you know, moving forward, um, you know, I'm going to take care of you and I'm, I'm going to do my best to, to help you get through this. So I thought that that was um, very valuable because I, you know, I think kind of I wear my um, emotions on my sleeve sometimes. And if I think something looks terrible, you know, it's kind of hard for me to hide that. Um, and it's definitely something that patients can pick up on. Amy, just remind me, we don't spend any time in clinic together, right? Because I don't want you seeing my page. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was horrible. <laughs> oh, no, that was me. That was me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just avoid uh, that. Good for you. <laughs> avoid. <laughs> yes, sir. I was wondering, uh, Dave Glassman here, I was, the, um, the difference between smoking and tobacco use. Uh, Mimi, you commented on that, uh, you know, there's some, it hasn't quite been figured out whether it's the smoking or the nicotine so yes, far, sir. like for people vaping or people that are on nicotine supplementation, like patches or gum. Um, did, uh, were you able to identify any, any specifics on that? And I was going to pull the audience and see what other folks do as far as cautioning against either of those. Um, do you just tell people not to smoke or do you recommend uh, avoiding all nicotine products whatsoever? Yes, sir. Um, so I think that the best literature is really on the tobacco smoke. I'm trying to pull up the, the slide, the TCDD. Um, it's with, it, it's actually part of the, the cigarette smoke and that's the halogenated, um, hydrocarbon that I had mentioned that can in interfere with osteoblast formation. Um, I think that might've been the, um, the Hadley, the Hadley study. Um, let me see, but in terms of nicotine use, I, I, I think that that literature is a little weaker, um, but I still, I still wouldn't, I still wouldn't strongly recommend to my patients to continue um, chewing tobacco or vaping. Um, but again, I think that the, the, the actual uh, cigarette smoke um, has been implicated. In, in the clinical studies, basic science is pretty strong on the nicotine though, right? Um, I, yeah, because uh, so. I think nicotine disrupts the microvascular, tour, right, which is the neovascularization portion of the fusion. Um, I think that's where the nicotine has its worst effect, you know, versus right. the smoking, like you mentioned, is on the is on the osteoblast itself. The nicotine is on the, the vascular structures. Yeah, it does cause the vasoconstriction, which decreases blood flow. So I've counseled my patients on that. 
again, um, not, I don't, again, I, I don't know if it's been proven in the clinical studies, um, but I, I think it makes logical sense. And like you said multiple yeah. times, you have, in some ways you have to take it in context. If that's the only risk factor is, you know, chewing tobacco, for instance, uh, versus, you know, a 70 year old with peripheral vascular disease that smokes, you know, is, you know, on cancer treatment, you know, and on chronic steroids for their scleroderma or whatever, like that patient's a disaster, right. For, from a, from a arthrodesis standpoint. So, you know, understanding things in the context of their, um, of, of the patient as a whole, I think is, is also super important here, but I, I, I'd be curious too, Dave, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a no nicotine, no smoke kind of guy, um, for usually a month before surgery. So, um, and then three months post-op, um, I don't know what everyone else sort of does right now, but, um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I actually think tested it twice. They yeah. actually get tested on a laboratory basis twice before surgery. Strong move. Don't trust those patients. The um, do you do a serum? Serum? Do you do a serum continine? Yeah, Bob. Yep. And, and do you have any sense of how long, Bob? Like if they smoked a week before, would that still come up? I, or does it I, have to be? I, I, I test them uh, four to six weeks before, and then the week before, and they have to be clear on both. Yeah. Same here. Yeah, I've trusted my patients. I haven't done the testing, but I, um, you know, mandate, like, like you say, no smoking six weeks before, three months after. Um, when people are chewing tobacco or using nicotine supplements or vaping, I have kind of not been as stern um, in saying, oh, you have to stop that or I, we won't do this elective case. Um, and I guess that's based on more. Eventually, the, uh, the eventually you'll have to. Eventually you'll have to. The payers will mandate it. As it affects the outcome. And uh, you think, um, is there enough clinical data to support that decision and limit that on those patients? Because, I mean, there's certainly, um, you know, side effects for the patient for having to go through the, you know, go through a huge lumbar surgery and then also stopping any nicotine use at the same time. Psychological side effects? Right, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's, that's true. That, that, that's... Uh, I don't know that that's, that's the stretch, I would say, <laughs> you know, trying to figure out whether that's actually a meaningful quality of life impact versus the negative consequences of a failed surgery. Right. Yeah. That's a reasonable point. Sure. Yes. Uh, it, it, you know, the clinical side is always harder to study, but the translational, and, and so we don't have that translational science worked out really well, but the basic science side is pretty strongly negative on nicotine and the, and the other factors that are involved in smoking specifically. And, you know, I think, I think if you take that information as a more pure science, it's hard to not factor it into your decision-making. And, and the payers, I think, see that smoking is a, you know, reasonably well associated with negative outcomes to the point where they're starting to mandate discontinuation, just like they are with obesity. Well, that's interesting. You've seen that started to see that with obesity now as well. Yep. Challenging. Well, maybe thank you for this great talk. It's not a um, completely clear topic, but uh, thank you for trying to uh, unmuddy it as best as you could. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Excellent job. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks, Mimi.